Oh, Rob Venn here, and today we're going to be looking at narrative structure. The picture here we've got is a pretty basic narrative structure that you'd expect to see in any story, let alone any kind of Hollywood film. Okay, at the beginning, down here, we've got this area called exposition. This is the beginning of the movie, usually the first, say, 20 30 minutes. Exposition, of course, is stuff that, exp you know, dialogue particularly, that explains things to the audience. So we're basically setting up the normality of our movie. Then, right here, you're going to get some kind of disruption. That's going to cause a problem that we need solving, and it will cause rising action. Things will get gradually worse and worse and worse for our protagonists until it reaches a climax. Then there will be falling action. This can be a lot steeper than this. It's going to be straight down you know, where you resolve your problems. And then the final part of the film is the denouement. Denouement basically means where you wrap all the sort of like loose ends of your story up, you know, cover up any plot holes, end the movie, everyone lives happily ever after. This is your typical narrative structure. We're going to look at some theories that explain this in a bit more detail. First thing though, what is narrative? Narrative isn't just the story of your movie. It's got two parts. The content of the story, you know, the things that happen in it, but also the form that that story takes. The way the story is told, the techniques that are used to tell it. So we can normally think of the story in terms of two elements of narrative. There's the story and the plot. So... You know, story is, you know, the tale you're telling. It's the overall messages. It's the, you know, it's what you're trying to communicate. Plot of things that happen. This happens, then this happens, then this happens. And those things tell the story. So, story refers to events that happen. Okay? So, things we're going to need to take into consideration. Where is our story set? both spatially and temporally. So spatial, we mean where it takes place. Temporal, we mean when. Diegesis, we mean the believability of the story. Is it convincing? What's the convincing world that's created? Realism and convincing believability being, of course, verisimilitude. So what events start the story? What are the inciting incidents? Who are the main characters? What conflicts do they face? What's at stake? What happens to the characters as they face this conflict? What's the outcome of the conflict? What is the ultimate impact on the characters? Especially in terms of character development. Do they evolve? Do they change? Do they grow? So these are the main elements we'd expect from any story. Plot, well that's how it's told. It's the structure, it's the form. You know, do you tell the story in a linear form? Beginning, middle, end. Is it in that order? Do you use flashbacks? Do you use multiple perspectives or points of view? So we think, is the major conflict in the story set up? How and when is that done? How and when are the main characters introduced? Is the story moved along so the characters have to face a central conflict? Is the major conflict set up to propel the film to its conclusion? Does the film resolve most of the major conflict that was set up in the outset? In other words, the denouement. These are the kind of things we have to ask ourselves when we're analysing stories and plots. So we're going to be looking at a variety of different theorists. That includes Pam Cook, Claude Levi-Strauss, Robert McKee, Zvetan Todorov, Vladimir Propp and Joseph Campbell. All of these are very famous names in film and media studies as well as literature. First one, this is the theory I learnt when I did A-level, it served me very well. Pam Cook in 1985. She says that the standard film narrative structure has to have linearity of cause and effect within an overall trajectory of enigma resolution, a high degree of narrative closure, and a fictional world that uh, contains very similitude, especially governed by spatial and temporal coherence. Lots of big words there, but it's actually very simple. Linearity of cause and effect. Story goes in a straight line, beginning, middle, end. Cause and effect. Something happens, it has an effect. Overall trajectory of enigma resolution. Trajectory is a straight path that something follows, and enigma is a problem. So in other words, stories are about solving problems, they have beginning, middle, and end, and they go in a very straight line. 
Simple as that. High degree of narrative closure. At the end of the film, all the story's wrapped up. The villains lose, the heroes win, the lovers get together, everyone lives happily ever after. There's also going to be a fictional world. Even documentaries are creating in uh, sort of like a aren't really truth. They are a representation of the truth. So we've got to think of this world as being fictional, even if it's a true story. It's got to have very similar to. In other words, it has to be convincing. It has to be believable. The audience has to believe this world. They have to believe these characters. It's not the same as being realistic. It just has to be believable. Spatial and temporal coherence. It has to make sense in terms of space and time. So if you were making an historical epic set in ancient Rome, you wouldn't see people walking around wearing digital watches. Lots of big words. Makes you sound clever. But essentially a very simple meaning. Another very important theory here. Claude Levi Strauss. 1964 from his book The Roar and the Cooked. Called Levi Strauss was a structural linguist and an anthropologist. He looked at the way in which language shapes culture. And he says that in language we tend to think of things in terms of being binary opposites. He talked about raw and cooked, for example. But in narrative we think of hero-villain. We think of good versus evil. Law and order versus criminality. We think of, you know... One country versus another. We think man versus woman. Whatever. Conflict is necessary for drama. Nearly all stories have some kind of conflict. And they will involve binary opposites. Not all stories have binary opposites. But most of them do. Very academic theories there. But now we've got a much more practical one. Robert McKee is a screenwriting guru. He's very, very famous in Hollywood. He's had massive influence on... Um, screenwriting and how stories in Hollywood are written. Um, he talks about the basic three-act structure. The beginning, the middle, the end. Act one sets up your it's your um, exposition. It sets up your story. Act two is your rising action. Act three is your denouement. So at the beginning of our story, we set up what normality is, and then there's some kind of inciting incident. Something that happens that sets the story going. Then things will get progressively more complicated, and things will get worse and worse for our hero or our protagonist. There are things will reach a crisis point, they'll get even worse, it looks like everything's over. But then there'll be a climax, things are so bad, drastic action has to be taken, and then there's resolution, all our problems are solved, everything turns out to be okay. Now, of course, this doesn't cover every story, but it covers the vast majority of them. If we want to put that in more academic terms, we can look at Svetlana Todorov. He's also a structural linguist who looked at how stories and language work. He called the beginning the equilibrium. Equilibrium means balance. Everything is balanced, everything is normal, everything is safe. Then there's a disruption that causes a disequilibrium. It un unbalances everything. Somebody will then have to recognise this disruption and then they will have to take action against that disruption and finally they will restore a new state of equilibrium. The Adeno Mon at the end. Another famous um, anthropologist who looked at language, Vladimir Propp, um, he, back in 1928, um, brought a book called The Morphology of the Folk Tale, in which he analysed Russian fairy stories and looked at their common narrative alum elements. And he's a very, very often quoted expert when it comes to film studies and media studies. Um, he identified seven basic character types in fairy tales. Now, these won't apply to all movies, and they won't apply to many of the movies we're looking at. But it does apply to your classic, you know, mainstream Hollywood film. Think of your Star Wars movies, your Harry Potters, your Marvel franchises, your Lord of the Rings, whatever it is. They will all feature these kind of characters. First of all, you will have a villain, also known as the dragon in his theories. That is some antagonist for our protagonist or hero to fight against. It may be a person... It may not literally be a person. It could be a thing. You know, something that is negatively affecting them. There will be 
a character like, you know, Jaws in Jaws, Darth Vader in Star Wars, Saruman in Lord of the Rings, whatever. Then you'll have a donor. Sometimes these characters can be mixed, by the way. Donor is someone who prepares the hero or gives the hero some kind of magical object. Think Gandalf in the Lord of the Rings films. Think uh, Yoda or Obi-Wan Kenobi in the Star Wars films. Magical object. Think of, you know, the ring in Lord of the Rings. Think Luke Skywalker's lightsaber. Or even, you know, the, teaching him the Force. There will be a magical helper. Again, often the same character as the donor. Magical helper will be, again, Darth Vader, not Darth Vader, Ben Kenobi or, um, you know, Gandalf or Yoda or whatever. The princess and her father gives the task of the hero, identifies the false hero, marries the hero, often sought for during the narrative. Think about your classic fairy tale stories. They're often about rescuing princesses from a tower, rescuing them from a dragon, whatever. The princess sadly and quite misogynistically is the reward for the hero doesn't necessarily have to be a person could be anything that the hero is rewarded with or wins dispatcher somebody who sends the hero off on their quest again could be anybody could often be the same person as the donor or the helper obviously as the hero the hero is the person who we identify with, the person we follow during the story, they're the ones who go off on some kind of quest, they're the ones who are our main characters. There's often a false hero as well. Someone will take credit for the hero's actions or tries to marry the princess or whatever. Think Boromir in the Lord of the Rings films, think um, Lando Calrissian in the Star Wars movies. Very influential theory of Vladimir Props but not necessarily going to be applicable to all of our films we're studying. However, a better theory that he did use, and this is really a stretch and challenge one, you don't really need to know this one, but it's a good one. Uh, Vladimir Prop and Viktor Shiglovsky, I think that's how you pronounce it, talked about two different things in narrative. Shajet and Fabula. Not 100% sure about those pronunciations, but I think Shajet. That is the employment of the narrative, the things that happen in the structure of the story. Fabula is the chronological order of the events contained in the story. So it's, you know, like I was saying earlier, but the difference between story and plot, basically. So, Shajet is the actual things that happen, the structure of the story. Is it told in a linear manner? Does it flash back and forward? Is it some from different viewpoints? Fabula is, you know, the chronological order. So it may not actually be presented in that order, but you know, think of a film like Irreversible or um, you know something like that's told backwards. You know, you, you know it'd be the story the right way around, basically. Jean Luc Godard went as far to say, "Is a story should have a beginning and a middle and an end, but not necessarily in that order." Very famous quote. Then we've got Joseph Campbell. Now this is an exceptionally influential theory. All right, many filmmakers of you know people like Steven Spielberg, people like George Lucas, learned about Joseph Campbell's theories when they were in university and film school, and they put it into their movies. Um, his book, The Hero of a Thousand Faces, very readable. Highly recommend having a read of that. It's very good. He's even got a series on Netflix. It's a series that he did back in the 80s. It's on Netflix that you can watch. Um, basically, he talked about the hero's journey. He analysed fairy tales, legends, stories and religions from across the world and found their common conventions. He called it the hero's journey. It was also called the um, universal hero monomyth. And he said that stories... Myth, legends, myths have a common structure. At the beginning, we see the ordinary world, the equilibrium that Todd Roth would have talked about. An ordered world the, whole, the hero will choose or be forced to abandon. Think of the Shire in the Lord of the Rings films. There will be a call to adventure. Some problem or challenge will arise that has to be addressed. Think of this as the disequilibrium from Todd Roth's structure. But at first, 
Our hero doesn't want to go. They'll refuse that call. Think of Star Wars. In Star Wars, Luke Skywalker finds the message from Princess Leia and R2-D2. Ben Kenobi tries to convince him to go to Mos Eisley. But Ben Luke's like, oh, I can't go. I've got the harvest. My uncle needs me. Obviously, we've got a meeting with a mentor. Again, think Star Wars. You know, we've got Luke Skywalker meeting Obi-Wan Kenobi. Crossing the first threshold, the hero commits to the adventure. In this case, going to Mos Eisley with um, Obi-Wan. They will be tested. They will meet allies. They will meet enemies. The hero will have to learn the rules that will govern his or her quest. At some point in the film, there will be an old story. There will be an approach to the innermost cave. This is the most dangerous confrontation. Um, perhaps it's the location where the treasure is stored or where the villain is. It's the object of the quest. Um, you can think about the, um, the the Death Star being the innermost cave in Star Wars. They make this very literal in the Empire Strikes Back, where Luke Skywalker goes into a cave and actually fights Darth Vader, and he's got his own face and all that kind of stuff. There will be some kind of ordeal. The hero will face their fear, or a mortal enemy will seem more powerful. They will then get a reward. This is called seizing the sword after, of course, King Arthur and the story of pulling the Scalibur out of the stone. <coughs> and then the hero will be able to celebrate their victory. Most stories will kind of end there. But sometimes there will be a road back where they have to get back home being chased by the vengeful forces or the villain. Um, there may be some final confrontation with death, which is called the resurrection. But then finally they will return home with their elixir. This is the establishing of a new equilibrium that Todorov would have told about. They return to the ordinary world, but they've gained wisdom, knowledge, they've grown, they've gained something from their adventure. They can't go back to the way things were. This is a highly influential theory. Star Wars was famously written specifically to fit this pattern and template. Um, I remember seeing an interview with um, uh, so, um, Leonard Nimoy talking about Star Trek IV, which he directed, and he specifically pointed out that he wrote Star Trek IV to meet Joseph Campbell's theories. Now this one is specific to horror movies. But um, it does have a lot of crossover with some other theories. Noel Carroll, 1990, in his book The Philosophy of Horror or Paradoxes of the Heart. Um, he says that at the beginning of the movie, the disequilibrium, as Todd would have called it, um, comes in the onset phase. In this case, a monster or a disorder is created. I think Frankenstein, for example, where Dr. Frankenstein creates the creature. There will be then some kind of discovery phase where a protagonist discovers the disorder or the monster. A confirmation phase where the protagonist must convince others that the monster or disorder exists and of its dangers. Because, you know, our heroes will find the creature, but no one will believe them. No one believes that this monster's out there. There will probably be an expert that comes in to explain things. Think of... Um, Van Helsing in Dracula, or um, Dr. Loomis in the Halloween films. And then there will be a confrontation or disorder phase. The protagonist has to destroy the monster to restore normality. Again, very similar to what Todorov or Campbell were saying, but this is specific to horror movies. So, some theories for your glossary. Denouement, plot, story, narrative... Linearity, trajectory, enigma, narrative closure, verisimilitude, temporal, spatial, apocalypse. Well, the end of the world, basically. Equilibrium, binary opposites, Fabler and Chagette. The theories, Pam Cook, Robert McKee, Claude Levi Strauss, Zvetan Todorov, Vladimir Prop, Vladimir Prop and Viktor Shivalovsky, and Joseph Campbell. I've gone through them pretty quickly. You should be able to easily recognize where they appear in films. If you've got any questions, you know where I am. And I'll talk to you next time.